So um, this webinar, Intro to SeatGeek, um, we're just going to cover, go through the basics of SeatGeek, how to get started with it. Um, and so I'm just going to go through some slides really fast, and then we'll jump into actual, actually doing some analysis. Um, and so I'm Dylan. I'm with the product innovation team here at Flojo. Um, I do a lot of support. Um, so just to jump into the basic SeatGeek workflow, basically what we use SeatGeek for is um, a few steps. You know, um, first I'm going to show us how to get started, but then we'll go through quality control, dimensionality reduction, clustering, and differential expression analysis. Um, and all these steps are kind of important for helping us identify our populations of interest within our single cell sequencing data. So to get started, um, you can download SeatGeek from our website. Um, and uh, you should be able to find out in the downloads on our website. Um, and you can analyze any data in SeatGeek uh, if you sign up for a uh, trial. So you can sign up for a free SeatGeek trial. I think it lasts 60 days. And you can use any data with SeatGeek to try and analyze. Um, and there's also um, a link down here at the bottom to the Flojo Exchange. So if you go to our website and go to Flojo Plugin Exchange, um, that's a list of all of our plugins, and I'll be using some plugins here today in the CQ demo. So plugins are pretty important, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. Um, and then, uh, and I just got asked for the link, so I can go ahead and put that in the chat, sure. Um, oops, if I can go back. There we go. Can I copy this? Um, yeah, I can, I can, I can answer. I can put the link in the chat box. Uh, let me just go ahead and so our plugins are available at www.flojo.com slash exchange, um, and our free trial is available. Here. Okay. So I'm going to move on now to the next slide. Um, so, okay, accepted file types in SeatGeek. Um, we accept the standard outputs from the Cell Ranger and the Seven Bridges pipelines. Um, those file types are H5 files, a matrix.mtx file with TSV barcodes and TSV genes. And a CSV file. Um, I guess also to note for VDJ analysis, we do have a VDJ plugin that you can use with VDJ analysis, and it uses the two standard output files from um, the Seven Bridges and the Cell Ranger pipelines. So, um, a note, and we'll talk about it this more later Seven Bridges did update, so now their output files have changed slightly. When you get your output file from Seven Bridges now, it'll be a file that says MEX dot zip at the end of it. And what you'll do is you'll unzip that file and in that folder then will be compressed versions of the matrix.mtx barcodes.tsv and genes.tsv file, which we can then load into SeatGeek. And I'll show more about that later. Okay, so this is what SeatGeek looks like. If you're familiar with Flojo, SeatGeek has a familiar feel to it. It has buttons at the top, and then it has some gene sets, a list of samples, and a population hierarchy. Um, so it kind of looks and feels similar to Flojo version 10, um, but there's a, some key differences, such as the gene sets, and we'll, we'll use SeatGeek more later. Um, another key difference between SeatGeek and Flojo is that it has two views in SeatGeek, whereas Flojo only has one. So in SeatGeek, there's two views, one called cell view, which is where each dot in our graph window represents an individual cell, and the X and Y axis are typically um, are typically gene markers, and so we're looking at the expression of certain genes and what cells express those genes. Um, and then the other option, so you can see the top here, it says cell view. If you click on gene view, it'll switch your view to gene view. And in gene view, your X and Y axis are populations, and each dot on the graph represents an individual gene. Um, and so it's showing you that genes expression within each of the uh, cell populations. If you drew a gate in gene view, 
it would make a gene set, whereas if you drew a gate in cell view, it makes a subset. Um, within gene view, um, you can click on this all genes button, and that will allow you to view genes from a specific subset. Okay, so when you get started in SeatGeek, the first thing I tend to do when I add my data is normalize it. Typically, I normalize it to counts per 10,000. Um, that's a pretty standard normalization that has been used for a while in bulk sequencing. There are some other types of normalization that can be performed in SeatGeek, uh, especially using um, some of our plugins. And so I would encourage you to investigate those as well. But counts per 10,000 normalization is pretty standard. Okay. So what does normalization do? You know, what does counts per 10,000 normalization do? Um, normalization is trying to remove the variance that comes from the sequencer. Um, when it's sequencing, it doesn't treat every, well, it doesn't read every cell the same amount. And so some will have a much larger library size than others, even though they could be the same cell phenotype as just one was sequenced for longer, it was treated more by the sequencer, so it has a larger library size. So if you compare it a, li a cell with a library size of 10,000, to a cell with a library size of 5,000, you might expect that it looks like the cell 10,000 has twice as much expression, but that's just because it was sampled for twice as long. So in order to normalize that expression between the cells so that we can compare the 5,000 cell to the 10,000 cell and know that they're the same, and basically we make the effective library size of all the cells 10,000 is a pretty standard strategy. Um, and so you can see what that would look like here. This is our QC plot with a library size and genes expressed. Um, I and mean, you can see there's a spread in library sizes, but then after normalization, we would with the library size would look something more like this. Um, and I should note though, SeekGeek will always display when you're looking at the library size in SeekGeek, it'll always be the unnormalized library size. So we'll show you the original library size, not the normalized version, but all the rest of the data will be normalized. Okay, so I kind of hinted at it in the last slide, but the second step we do in SeekGeek is quality control. So if there's a QC quality control button in the SeatGeek workspace, click on it, and we can perform quality control on our sample. Typically what we'll do here, we look at these three different graphs. Um, we'll select the quality cells, removing based on library size. Um, we'll also try and identify genes of interest, typically removing genes that have low or no reads in our cells, um, because those ones are obviously not interesting. And then also grabbing the highly dispersed genes, because those ones are probably the most interesting, they're changing the most between our cell populations. So we typically wanna um, isolate those so we can focus on them later. I'm moving kind of fast through these slides, but we'll revisit all of this later when I'm in SeatGeek. Okay, so quality control, quality cells, oh, we kind of already covered this a little bit, but basically we're gonna look at the genes expressed versus the library size. The genes expressed is the number of different genes expressed within the cell. So it can go from zero to the number of genes that you uh, recorded in your data set. And the library size is the total number of reads for all genes in a given cell. And so, um, you know, again, that's what we're normalizing when we do counts per 10,000 normalization. It's also, we're gonna wanna remove cells with a low library size because they typically aren't interesting. They, well, they, they typically don't have enough information to really be comparable to cells with a high library size. Um, so, so here we'll just try and gate the quality cells, remove any outliers. Hey, quality genes. Again, it's, it's cells expressing versus total reads. So total reads on the x-axis, cells expressing the y. Cells expressing is the number of different cells expressing a gene. It goes from zero to the number of cells that are in a data set. Typically, we want to just take genes that are being expressed in at least you know, over 10 or over 20 cells because if the gene isn't being expressed in that many cells, it's not a very interesting gene for us. Um, on the x-axis, the total reads. Um, so this is the number of reads the gene has across all cells. I would typically ignore the x-axis, just focus on the y-axis of this plot. Okay, and then the second graph window here is the cells expressing versus dispersion. The y-axis, or the x-axis of this plot is the same as the y-axis of the previous plot. And then the y-axis of this plot is dispersion, which is the variance divided by the mean. The more highly dispersed the gene is, the more it's changing between, changing its expression between the different cell populations. So we generally wanna focus on the most highly dispersed genes because those genes are changing the most. Okay. Dimensionality reduction. So this is a really important step in single cell sequencing analysis. For flow cytometry, it isn't as important because 
the flow parameters are so good at finding and separating populations of interest. But in single cell analysis, um, we'll typically want to do something like principal component analysis to try to take the hundreds of genes we have and um, derive parameters from them that describe the populations and are describing the differences we see across all hundred of those genes. And so it's taking these small differences within each of the genes that we're looking at and kind of combining them together to magnify those differences to see trends um, in our data. So you can see here in this principal component analysis it's separated out into multiple populations, my genes. Um, and typically we'll wanna generate, you know, 10 to 15 principal components that we can then use for further machine learning. Um, and that further machine learning will look like T-SNE or clustering. So T-SNE is another type of dimension I reduction. Um, whereas principal component analysis is more for making new parameters. T-SNE makes a visualization. So it's a two dimensional map that should group our cells together based on their similarities. Um, and so I'll typically give T-SNE our principal components, which will then help the T-SNE group the cells together based on their characteristics and then we can maybe see our different subsets and try to visual, visualize that data. Um, after doing dimensional reduction or even before, um, I would also suggest doing clustering. So there's a few different types of clustering. I have phenograph shown here. Later, I'll use Surat. Um, Surat's pretty popular. But what clustering does is it groups the cells together based on their similar characteristics. So it tries to put similar cells together. Um, TSNE does this visually, clustering tools like Phenograph, um, I just group them into in populations and we annotate those populations as one through 19. And so like cluster one, you know, hopefully has a group of cells that um, are all kind of uh, the same cell type. And then we can use this to identify, you know, cell like group cells by their cell type and then look at those different cell types and hopefully see some changes and see some unique cell types within those clusters. Okay, um, differential expression of genes. So differential expression analysis is really important in single cell sequencing. Um, we can do it built into SeqGeek um, by putting um, in gene view, a population of interest on our Y axis, and then a comparison population on our X axis. And so once we've done that, we can press this up and down arrow. It'll generate a volcano plot which is this V-shaped plot um, that has fold change on the x-axis and a, a Q value on the y-axis. The fold change is basically showing if you divided the y-axis of the previous plot by the x-axis of the previous plot, what is that ratio? If the fold change is one, that means the expression is the same in the population on the y-axis and x-axis. If the population is two, it means there's twice as much expression in the population on the y-axis of our previous plot. And if the population is like negative two, it would mean there's half as much expression. And so using this volcano plot, we can identify our up and down regulated genes. The y-axis is just a Q value. So it's a statistical significance as that decreases, it becomes more significant. Um, it decreases going up the y-axis in this case. So we wanna take you know, everything above this dotted line, for instance, it might be our up regulated genes for whatever population we're looking at currently. We'll do more examples of this when we're in the software. Okay, so that basically covers our um, slides. Um, I would highly encourage you, actually we have, uh, well, we have a different support email in here. You can reach out to seekeek at bd.com or flowjetbd.com. They both come to us um, and me or my colleagues will answer it. If you have any questions, if you wanna set up a screen share, talk about your data. We're happy to do that too. So feel free to send us an email to either flojo at b.com or you can send one to seekeek at b.com and we'll be happy to talk to you. Um, and so that's all the slides that I have for now. Um, but let's go ahead and dive into some data because we started kind of late. And so I wanna make sure we get through um, most of the analysis. So yeah, feel free to drop any questions into the chat. Um, the PowerPoint should be available when they upload the record webinar onto the website. There's going to be a link to the PowerPoint. And you can find our record webinars under like the Learn tab of our website. It says Webinars. And then if you scroll down, it has a place where it says Previously Record Webinars. You can click on that. 
sometime later this week, they're going to upload this as a webinar and we'll have a link to the PowerPoint. They might also send the PowerPoint. I can't remember if they do that. Um, okay. So, okay, let's go ahead and dive in. The first thing I wanted to discuss, and I kind of already mentioned this, but it's that Seven Bridges updated their um, output. So I just want to take a look at the new Seven Bridges output and discuss just how to load it into SeatGeek and what to do with it. So the Seven Bridges new output is this. It's this MEX. The, the, it always ends with like, you know, you wanted to get the RSEC moles per cell MEX dot zip file. And then what we can do with this, once we have it downloaded on our computer, to load it into SeatGeek, what we need to do is we need to first unzip it. So just click twice. This will unzip it. Bam. Then open up this folder. And inside, there's three more compressed files. Um, so we have to go through and unzip each of these. So you just double click, and you can unzip these GZ files. So at the end with GZ, that means it's compressed. Just go ahead and click twice on it, and it will decompress it. And so now I finally have files I can use, this matrix.mtx file and a features.tsv and a barcodes.tsv file. So now I can go ahead and grab this matrix.mtx file, load it into SeatGeek, and it will load the data. There's still one last step, though, that I was just doing because uh, right now its name is just matrix.mtx. It's not super useful. Um, I kind of want it to be named something better. So what I would do is I would go ahead and click twice on the file in SeatGeek. Um, just make a histogram. So if you just click on the y-axis of a graph window, you can change it to histogram. Make a histogram any parameter on the x-axis. Hit the T button, the transform button next to the x-axis, and set the scale to linear. So this will make a linear version of the x-axis. Now you can draw a gate and say, um, name the subset. And whatever you give this name, I would just name it whatever you want to call the file. So for instance, we could just name it the default name that whoever acquired this data gave the file. Um, and so I'm just going to call it the name that I had originally. Hit OK. So now you can see 100% of my cells are inside this gate on the histogram. And so now 100% of my cells are, oh, I'm actually missing two cells, are there. Let me get my outliers. OK, now really 100% of, of my cells are there. Um, and so you can see the cell number matches. That means all the cells are there. Perfect. I can then right click, export this population. And then the reason I'm exporting it is because then I can make a new file, a new CSV file. It's going to combine my matrix.mtx file with my features and barcodes file all together into one file. Um, and it's going to have the name that I just gave it, which is what I want. Um, and so I just go to advanced options here, take out where it says exports. Now it's just going to use this name at the top here. I'm putting it on my desktop, so I can go ahead and hit export. And it made the file here on my desktop. So now for future analysis, I could just load this one file and work with it. And it will have the name that I gave it, which will be useful if I load multiple files, because the default naming, all these files are just called matrix.mtx, which is not very useful as far as names go. OK, so that workaround's a little wonky. Um, I'm going to do it again in a second here. Again, this is just to name, rename those matrix.mtx files, which always have the same name, to give them a more unique name. Um, so I'm not going to save that. And let's just go ahead and get started with a new workspace, though. Um, that was, again, the new Seven Bridges output. Um, I'm going to go use some different data because uh, what, what I have for the new seven bridges output isn't as interesting as this other data, which is um, an open source data set I found on the NCBI database. Um, you can see this gene extension number here. Um, and this is just some COVID data um, that I got from there. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, this output's actually from the Cell Ranger pipeline, I believe. Um, it has Cell Ranger and Seven Bridges now have very similar outputs. Um, they both output these compressed matrix.mtx files and TSV files. So again, I just have to decompress these files, and then I can load the matrix.mtx in. It'll automatically connect with the features.tsv and barcodes.tsv. I don't need to load all three. Um, and then once I've loaded it, 
it's here in my Geek, see Geek Workspace. Um, this data set has multiple files. I'm going to load both, both of them. I'm going to load two of them just to kind of get us more than one file to work with. Um, I could load all the data. It's just it, you know, it would take longer to analyze. Obviously, the more data I load. Um, so I'm just going to load these two files. Um, again, you'll notice. So now this is the case where if I've loaded multiple files, the names are the same. That's really annoying. They're all called matrix.mtx. So what I was just doing again is just coming in here to SeatGeek, click twice on the sample to open up the graph window, switch the y-axis the graph window to histogram, switch the x-axis, click on the T button here, make it linear, and then just go ahead and draw a gate, say um, whatever you want to name this. I think this is a condition called ball one. Um, so that was just the original name they gave to the sample. I, I'll keep it. Um, and then this second one is ball two. So let's just go ahead and call it that. Again, it doesn't really matter what I use here. Um, and so I actually want to combine these files together. But first, I'm going to do the thing where I export them so I can give them new names. Um, so again, just to do that, I can select both these files. So if I command click or control click, I can highlight both of these, right click, export slash concatenate, um, leave it as in CSV, choose all genes here, make sure it goes to somewhere I like, such as my desktop. And then under advanced options, remove the prefix, and then should be good to go. So I'll just go ahead and export those. It's going to make two new files for me on my desktop. We should see them pop up somewhere down here. I can tick this box that says new workspace to automatically load these files into a new workspace. Um, it might take a second to export files, especially the larger the files are. Again, what it's basically doing right now is combining my matrix.mtx file with its two TSV files. So that way they're all together, um, makes it easier to use in SeatGeek. Um, so I would just suggest doing that. Okay, close because we're done with that. Um, so I think I should have opened a new, oh, it's taking a second. Um, it's loading the data right now into a new SeatGeek workspace for me. Okay, what a one. I can go ahead and close this old one. I don't really need those matrix.mtx files now. I have these new CSV files. Another cool thing about CSV files is you can kind of open and load them more easily into other softwares. And so if you want to do any analysis, maybe in R or in you know, some other software or even Excel. If you want to open the files in Excel, you can do that. And you could see the gene expression there. Um, I would demonstrate that, but Excel has limits to what it can load. So it might actually crash if you open a file that's too big. Okay, so I loaded these two files. Now what I'm going to do with them, before I even start my analysis, I just want to combine them together. Um, they're the same condition, so they're going to be similar data. Um, this can just help me pull my data together. If I want to later, I can always split these apart and look at them individually. Um, but it's going to be better to just combine them together at first. That way, if I do machine learning or other tools on the data, it'll apply it to all the data. So it'll all have the same machine learning and then the same well, results. And so then I can compare individual, pop individual samples with those results and see maybe what the differences are. So I'm going to right click on this export slash concatenate again. This time I'm choosing concatenate at the very top here. I can again choose basically the same settings, all genes, give it a name. So I might just call this something like combined ball. Um, and then go ahead and just concatenate those. Again, it's going to take a little bit of time for it to just combine all the data together and make a new file. Um, we're making a lot of new files, I know, just before we even start, but it's just to kind of format the data nicely with some of these new output formats that we have from Seven Bridges. Okay, right, perfect. So now let's go ahead. Okay, open up a new workspace again. Load that combined file into it. Again, I can close this. And we should load our data soon. 
Um, while that's loading, let's just take a look at SeatGeek's workspace. So if you're familiar with Flojo, again, this workspace should look kind of familiar. But what we have here at the top, we have some buttons. Um, under the analyze, so we have these different tabs, analyze, genes, workspace, edit. Underneath these different tabs, there are buttons available to us. Uh, most of the time I'll spend on the analyze tab. Um, this has my primary workflow buttons, my normalization, my quality control, my dimensionality reduction, clustering. Um, so that's where most of those features are. Genes has my ability to make gene sets. So if I want to make or manipulate a gene set, group some genes together, all that's all available under the genes tab. The workspace tab has the plugins, which is an important tool. Um, something else I would do, because I'm going to end up using this eventually, is I would add some Boolean tools here to the workspace tab. You can add buttons if you go to this little ribbon icon to the left of the heart icon. And if you click on ribbon, it opens up this. You can go get your Boolean tools from here and just drag and drop those onto the workspace tab, adds the Boolean tools there. So now I can use them for future use. Um, edit tab has eh, nothing really too useful here. And then there's some secret buttons under the SeatGeek icon such as saving, which is probably the most important button. So def definitely check out the SeatGeek button, uh, the little SeatGeek icon here in the top left corner. Make sure you save your data. Um, and you know, it's, it's always a smart thing to do when you're doing your analysis is save a lot. OK. So I've loaded my data. Um, before I even start looking at the data, what I really want to do is perform some normalization. Um, so let's go up to here, choose normalization. But bef actually, before I even perform my normalization, I probably want to group my genes together first. Um, so I can do that by going to the genes tab here, make a new stack gene set. And I just want to um, call this maybe genes. I just kind of want to grab all my initial genes because later I might make some artificial parameters. Those might get grouped with my genes. I don't want that to happen sometimes. So. I just want to get all my initial genes. Um, I can hit Control A or Command A to select all my genes here at the bottom. Um, there's already one parameter sample ID that I don't want to include, so I'm just going to deselect that here. Sometimes there's going to be other parameters in this list that we don't want to include, such as if we performed um, site seek um, or uh, I can't remember what the other type of antibody sequencing is called, um, but we can look at our antibody, we can remove our antibody parameters from the list of genes here, so that way we can just get our gene parameters. If you have antibody parameters, you want to treat your gene parameters and your antibody parameters separately, especially for normalization. Um, so I would encourage you to make separate gene sets, one with just your gene parameters, one with your antibody. If you have antibody parameters, you can always search for them. I don't, so you can see there's nothing here. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of filtering tools. Um, all right, so I'm just going to add all my genes. I'm excluding that sample ID because that's not a gene. That's going to be useful for separating my samples, my you know sample one and sample two later. Um, let me go ahead and save that. So now I have this list of genes here. Um, when I, you can make lots of gene sets, so I can hit new stack gene set again. If I want to make something more specific, you know, I can like group all my mitochondrial genes together. The mitochondrial genes, um, you can you know, look at them in all genes. You can search for them here in this little box. Um, mitochondrial genes all have MT at the beginning of their gene name. MT obviously means mitochondrial. Um, so I can select all these genes, add them here. Here's my 13 standard mitochondrial genes. I can save that. Um, I might want to group those mitochondrial genes together because later we can use them to um, find or identify potentially dead cells. Dying cells tend to have higher mitochondrial gene expression. Um, so it's a good way to filter for dead cells. OK, so let's go ahead and perform that normalization I've been talking about. Um, again, so we have three parts of the workspace at the bottom here. This has a list of genes. This has a list of samples. I only have one sample, so I'm going to ignore this. Um, and then this at the very bottom here has our sample, and it's going to have all of its gates beneath it. So. Let's go ahead and go back to the Analyze tab and press Normalization. In the Normalization menu here, we want to hit Choose for choosing which parameters to include. 
and just make sure that sample ID parameter is not included um, or any you know antibody sequencing parameters we have, we also don't want to include. So I'm just going to choose all my gene parameters, hit add selected. It's going to add all 18,111 of them, hit select. I'm going to perform counts per 10,000 normalization. This is pretty standard. Um, go ahead and hit run. And it's going to quickly perform that counts per 10,000 normalization. Um, the only way we can tell it's finished is because it has this little blue um, thing to the left of the sample name that used to be gray. Uh, the blue color indicates that it's finished. You can see what type of normalization has been performed on it. Um, so that's the simplest way to do normalization. It's pretty standard. There's other tools for doing normalization in CKIC as well. Um, but yeah. After doing counts per 10,000 normalization, I would go to quality control next. Oh, if you hover, it sometimes does that. Um, so quality control, it pops open these three graph windows. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is, so opens up these three graph windows. Uh, I'm going to go left to right and explain these. The first one I'm going to look at is library size versus genes expressed. This is in cell view. So each dot here represents a cell. The next two graph windows are in gene view. So each dot represents a gene. But yeah, this first one's in cell view. Each dot represents a cell. It's kind of like Flojo. Um, and I'm going to start by just hitting this T button here. Changing the axis from linear to log shift. Log shift is nice for viewing data, especially data that's close to the zero. Um, but it, it views it in a logarithmic scale. And so that's going to be more useful for this data because I don't really care so much about the high end of my scale, the cells with a large library size. I'm more concerned about cells with a lower library size. Those ones might be my weird cells or my bad cells. Um, you can see this data already has had its library size cut off after a certain threshold. Looks like it's somewhere close to 500. Any cells with a library size lower than 500, it looks like this 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 you know, has the preprocessing has already gotten rid of that. This pre preprocessing was done probably in Cell Ranger. They probably just chose a threshold to remove cells with, of lower library size with. Um, but one thing that's interesting that we can see here is if you look at genes expressed, there's a lot of cells that have a lower number of genes being expressed. Um, those sometimes it can be a variety of things. Um, that might be some blood cells that got mixed into our other um, cells here. Um, in general, you know, you could you could investigate what those are. I think I'm just going to remove them because I don't think they're going to be very interesting to us. Um, and so I'm just going to focus on these cells that have kind of a normal number of genes being expressed and a high enough library size. I'm going to call those quality cells. Okay, so I drew this gate on my on my quality cells. Again, if you're new to gating, if you're new to Flojo, the gating tools, which is at the top here, you can click on the different shapes to draw different shapes. And what these gates do is they um, select what's inside of the gate, and we'll use that for future analysis. They exclude anything outside of the gate. So there's different shapes. I was using the polygon tool. Polygon tool, every time I click, it makes a dot, so I can kind of make whatever shape I want. And, um, you know, do that. So um, I drew this gate around my quality cells and made this subpopulation here in the gating hierarchy. So uh, the population is below my sample. It indicates that there's just 87.5% of the sample's cells inside the gate. Um, so we're just going to focus on those cells for future analysis. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and close this window and focus on my next two windows. Um, again, I'm kind of going through this quickly, but if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I'm going to switch both my axis to log shift. Uh, perfect. Okay. So my x-axis here is total reads. My y-axis is the cells expressing. Again, total reads is just the total number of reads for this gene across all cells. The y-axis, the cells expressing, it goes from zero to the number of cells originally in the data set, which is 7,531. So it's the number of different cells expressing that gene. Um, again, this is a gene view. So each dot on the graph represents, represents a gene. And we can actually see the gene's name if I hover over it. My mouse is a little too large because I made it big for the webinar. But um, you can see the gene names of the genes if you mouse over them, which is kind of neat. OK. So what I want to do in this gra second graph window here is I just want to isolate my genes that you know are expressed in at least a few cells. And so I want to maybe take 
a threshold of 10 or 20 on the y-axis here for cells expressing, and just take all the genes that are being expressed in at least 20 cells. Sometimes I'll cut off the top here. These genes at the top are housekeeping genes that are in every cell. Um, and the reason I might want to get rid of those is because they could be something like mitochondrial genes that you know we're probably not going to really want to use in our analysis. We're maybe going to want to get rid of those anyways when we do our um, mitochondrial gene gate. But for now, I'll leave them. Um, so I'm just going to take quality genes, everything above 20 I'm keeping. And so you can see when I drew this gate here, it did not make a subset like it did in cell view. What it makes instead is this um, quality genes gene list here in my lists. Um, if I double click on it, I can see the genes that are present in there, as well as the X and Y axis that I used to gate them. I keep getting that if I hover over something too long. Um, that's just because I'm kind of running it weird. Um, OK, so then. I can go to this last graph window here. Um, on the x-axis, I have cells expressing, which was the y-axis, my previous plot. And on the y-axis, I have dispersion. The first thing I want to do here, it, when I'm in gene view, again, this is gene view, so each dot represents a gene. In the top left corner, it says all genes. I want to click on that, and I want to focus on the genes I've already isolated, which are my quality genes. And what we'll see is since I drew this gate and I got rid of genes with a cell expression of less than 20, if I hit OK here, it's going to remove the genes with a cell expression less than 20. So that's that. And then dispersion here is my y-axis, um, variance divided by the mean. So if I just draw large dots, we can maybe. So another great tip for SeatGeek, I like to use large dots. So under display, it says draw large dots. You can make use that to make your dots bigger. If you're on a Mac, the display tab is up here at the very top of the Mac bar. On a PC, it'll just be at the very top of the graph window. There's a display tab, and you can say draw large dots. So that makes it easier to see your outliers because those outliers are potentially really important. And so I want to make sure I include the outlier there and just take the most highly dispersed genes, call this dispersed. I want to grab um, maybe around the top 1,000 highly dispersed genes. So a lot of times they get asked like, oh, how do I know when to do my cutoff for you know highly dispersed genes? Um, it is a little arbitrary. I just tend to take, again, around the top 1,000 or so most dispersed genes um, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large subset that we can then use for future analysis that'll be interesting. It gets rid of some genes that aren't very interesting, that aren't changing very much, that won't really give us information about the cell's phenotype and different states. Um, so yeah, it helps us just focus on our, our most interesting, our genes that change the most. Um, and I tend to grab around a thousand. There's, I don't do any cutoff based on the visual, um, shape of the graph. Um, you can always change, you know, the gate later if you want more genes or less genes. It's just kind of a starting point for our machine learning. We'll also look at all the genes later. So when we're doing like differential expression analysis, I'm not just going to use the dispersed genes. I'm going to use all my genes. OK, so done doing QC. I have my new gene sets over here. You can see my dispersed genes. There's 900 of them. Um, so I now I'm kind of ready to go with my analysis. Uh, if you're used to Flojo, what you might think we'd start with with our analysis is by clicking twice on this population here and doing some gating. I can do gating in SeatGeek. Uh, there's X and Y axis wings here. I can click on those X and Y axis wings to open up these panels, and I can search for any gene I want. Um, so for instance, I can search for, um, actually, let me do, um, these are mostly monocytes. Um, so let me look at some genes like LYZ, um, maybe like, um, no, we have, G we have GZMA, um, some grand enzyme. So there, there's some different genes. So you, so you can look at different genes in your X and Y axis here. Um, and just like Flojo, you could draw a gate. Um, but one thing to note already, almost all my cells are on, it even says at the very top here, all my cells are on the X or Y axis for the most part. There's only a few outliers here. And that's because most of my cells uh, either have expression of only one of these two genes. And so they have zero expression for the other gene. 
having zero expression for a gene is really common. Um, so if you're looking at most genes, most genes, you'll see zero expression for that gene. Um, so if I'm drawing a gate, I can do like LYZ positive cells. I can just take all these, say LYZ positive. 44% um, of my cells are there on the x-axis or yeah, on the x-axis. You can see there's basically no cells up here if I just get everything up here. Um, but if I move that down to the x-axis, you can see it gets 40, 48% of my cells. So I might take those as my LYZ positive cells. Um, if I grab the GZMA, there's gonna be a lot less of these, but let's see what happens. 20.5% GZMA positive. Um, any, so one thing that's unique again about sequencing is if, if the cells expressing even one read can be significant some, in some cases. So um, sometimes we'll wanna get even down to one read um, there's a bunch of cells. You, there's a tiny red dot here. I can make it bigger at the zero, zero. And that zero, zero red dot indicates the cells that are expressing zero reads of a given gene. And those ones are probably not very interesting. Um, so I may make some overlapping boxes here just to get my potentially GZMA positive and potentially LYZ positive cells. Um, OK, so. Let's go ahead, though. So I can I can draw gates like that, but that's not very useful. Um, in general, with single cell sequencing, we're not going to define a cell population by a single gene, which is what we might do in flow cytometry. If you did site seq or some sort of antibody sequencing um, or ab seq, um, we can use those ab seq parameters, the antibody parameters, to better define populations that has nice separation, kind of like flow cytometry. But if you haven't done ab seq, the best way probably to identify our populations is to do machine learning because machine learning can look at multiple genes at once. Um, and so let's get started with some machine learning just because that's gonna take some time. And while it's running, we can always come back and review some other things. So to do some machine learning, I'm gonna go to my quality cells here. I'm gonna start with dimensionality reduction. Again, if I hover, it makes this thing pop up, so I just better click. Um, if I go to methods here, I can choose PCA, principal component analysis, hit select genes. I'm just going to give it those dispersed genes I identified earlier. Um, again, I'm just hitting command A or control A to select all of these. Hit add selected, select. Um, I'm just going to run PCA on those dispersed genes. And this should work pretty quick. Return this result. Um, here, it's telling me the number, like the different principal components. The first principal component is going to describe the most variants, and then each principal component after the first is going to get less and less useful and have less and less information. Um, and so I'll want to take everything maybe down to a variance of 0.4 or 0.5, something like that. And so I'm just going to go down to 0.5 here. That's 13 principal components. That's pretty good. I'll hit OK. Um, and then I'll get these plots. There's some nice separation in this plot here. It looks like you can see maybe some cell populations that it's trying to separate. Um, so that's some nice visuals, my principal component one and two. Um, I can go look at the other principal components as well. As I go down the list, you'll see the separation is going to get less ni nice. So like seven and eight is kind of more ball-like. Um, most of the cells are grouped together. There's only a few cells that maybe are separating out. And then if I go to the very bottom of the list to 12 and 13, You'll see it's basically a giant ball. There's not really that much useful information. I can't really tell if any of these cells are at all separating based on something interesting. So the lower, the the higher the number, you know, the the higher numbered principal components like 12 and 13 aren't going to be as useful. If I had included 14 and beyond, they really would not have been adding any information. Um, I'm going to go ahead though and give all those principal components to my TSNE analysis. So principal components by themselves. Um, have limited use. And the main way I use principal components is for more dimensionality reduction. So again, I can't hover. Um, but if I click on dimensionality reduction, I can go to TSNE um, and hit select genes again. So I'm just going to keep TSNE this time, hit select genes. Up here at the top, choose parameters. Search for those principal components. You can just type in PCA. In general, in SeekGeek, I suggest searching just by typing in something's name, and that helps eliminate stuff really fast. I'm going to choose all 13 of those principal components. I could maybe leave out principal components 11, 12, 13. Um, they probably weren't giving me that much additional information. They may even make my results a little bit more muddy, but that's fine. I'll leave them in for now because they had a, a variance of 
0.5 or greater. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run on my TSNE. Should have returned results pretty fast for TSNE. Um, so I get this visual here. There's some very distinct separation. Um, basically, we have three main islands, and it looks like within each there might be some split. So that's pretty interesting. Um, I can copy this to my layout. So I haven't really talked about the layout yet, but this, this L-shaped button at the very top here opens the layout editor. Also, this button here. These both are the same. This is a blank, basically, PowerPoint slide that we can add images to, manipulate images. Um, and I just copied this image to the layout by pressing Command L. You can also copy images to the layout by right-clicking and saying Copy to the Layout Editor. This will just make the image here. And so I'm just going to copy my TSNE there because we might want to use it later for different types of visuals. OK, so I've done principal component analysis. I've done TSNE. I have some visuals. I want to group the cells together using clustering, though, because that's the most powerful tool we have. Um, to do clustering, there's some different options. There's built-in clustering in SeaGeek. It's a little simpler. Um, my favorite type of clustering is under workspace, under plugins. So, whoops, can't hover. Oh, darn it, what? Um, oh, one of my plugins, I I may have built a test plugin. That's really unfortunate. <laughs> um, so I, I make some of the plugins. I was making one last night, and I'm guessing that it is not being accepted by SeatGeek very well. Um, darn. So I'd have to save and restart if I want to remove that plugin. Um, really unfortunate. But let me go ahead and just do the built-in clustering. So under the plugins, if you go to the Flowjo Exchange, we have our plugins there. Uh, we have a Surat plugin. That's probably why I would suggest to do the clustering with is Surat. Unfortunately, first of all, we're kind of running low on time. And secondly, um, I have a bad plugin in my plugins because I was just building one again last night. So um, we, we're not going to use Surat right now. Um, but we could do the built-in clustering. Um, we could actually also look. I already have um, completed some clustering using Surat for this data set. So we could look at that as well. Um, but let's just do some built-in clustering um, using the clustering button here. Uses k-means. And then uh, the nice part about k-means is we can specify the number of clusters we would expect for this data set. I might give it something like 22. Um, and we can run the k-means clustering. Um, it's a little bit simplistic, so we'll see what the results look like. But hopefully, it kind of correlates at least a little bit with the um, populations that we see here in our TSNE. Um, OK, while that clustering is running, um, let's take a look at a few other things that we haven't covered yet here in this tutorial. One of the most important things is under quality cells, under gene view, we can do differential expression analysis. Um, man, SeaGeek may just be unhappy with me. Not sure if it's because, so I, sorry, I'm looking at this little secret um, window that I have that tells me what, what's going on in SeaGeek's code. Um, and just kind of seeing if it's going to let me keep going or if it's mad at me. And it's fine. So just finish the clustering. That was kind of fast. Um, Give me these k-means results. Man, um, even k-means, though, if I wanted to gate each of these individual peaks, I kind of have to go to the plugins tab to, oh, now it's letting me do plugins. Here we go. Um, don't know why I wasn't doing that before. So I can go to my plugins tab uh, and choose uh, auto cluster auto class. And then just choose my, no, sorry, not cluster autocast. There should be one called autogate. I don't think I have it with me. Again, you can get our plugins on the Flojo Exchange. If you click this thing at the very top here, I'll take you to our website where you can find all of our plugins. Um, and the main one I'd suggest using for SeatGeek is Surat. The ones that you can use for SeatGeek have the little SeatGeek loco. Some of these are Flojo only, some of these are SeatGeek only. Some of them are both. Um, so Surat, though, is the most important one for SeatGeek. Here it is. I was just you know downloading that, checking it out. Um, OK, so um, we're not going to really have time to look at the clustering results. I'll open up a workspace, though, that has those clustering results after we maybe take a look at some other things. Um, let's do differential expression analysis. So if I just go to gene view here, 
Um, we can do our differential expression analysis. Let's look at my LYZ positive cells. And let's just look at all the cells that are not LYZ positive. So I can do that by going to my Boolean gates under my workspace tab. Again, I added those earlier by going to this little customize ribbon button, choosing my Boolean gates and adding them here. And that adds some Boolean gates that I can then use. Um, if I click on them and say make not gate, it makes this not gate. I'm going to rename it because it says plus minus right now. I just want to say minus. Um, makes this not gate for LYZ. So this has all my LYZ positive cells. You can see that's 45.6% of the cells. This has all the rest of my cells, the cells that are not LYZ positive. So I want to compare those LYZ positive cells to the LYZ not positive cells. And gene view, if I click on the axis, it'll just give me a list of all my populations. I'll just click on LYZ positive and then LYZ not. At the top here, I'll press this up and down arrow to generate my volcano plot. That opens up my volcano plot of differential expression. You can see it's a pretty weird volcano plot it has. First of all, there's one outlier that's making it go really far to the negative. I might customize my axis. You can just kind of decrease the negative and maybe get that outlier by just getting the edge. Um, but even then, almost all my cells, uh, almost all my genes are expressed in all the cells that are not LYZ positive. A lot are really close to the one or they're below the one. Um, that's fine. I can take my upregulated genes by going out here to the two-fold change mark. I just tend to click, drag up to the, towards the top. Make sure you get those genes at the very top. Those are your most significant uh, statistically genes. And I call this up in LYZ. These are the genes that are upregulated in LYZ. It made a list of 130 genes. They might be kind of hard to see in this graph window. So again, you can draw large dots and then we can see more of them. Um, and let's get the down regulated genes in LYZ. So this is my down LYZ. Okay. Um, so I have this list of up and down regulated genes. If I click twice on one of these, um, you might not be able to see the header here because I have my screen set to dark mode. So I think it makes it kind of hard to see when you're on the zoom. Um, but at the very top here, you can see it has, um, this is just the uh, fold change for that gene. So you can see fold change of 13, the highest, I, I'm going to sort by fold change. And so the highest fold change is now listed, which is of course LYZ itself, um, followed by these other parameters. Um, so you can see what genes are uh, most significantly expressed within the population. You can also see uh, the statistical significance, but then also the um, different difference in expression level between this gene in the, in the population and in the rest of the cells. So even like these later genes, you can see there's a pretty significant difference in expression. Okay. So, okay, we're already three minutes over and I've, I've barely covered everything. That's differential expression. Um, okay, yeah, we've done most everything. Let's just look at some clustering results really fast. So we didn't really have time to run Surat right now but I do have Surat results here. Uh, here we go. Um, okay. Um, so you can see this is my same ball one, ball two gene uh, set data set. Um, and these are my Surat results. Um, and so what we'll start will return is these clusters. So it returned 13 clusters for me. Um, and in the layout editor, we can actually see it makes some images as well. It's taking a second to load them. Um, okay, it's taking a long second to load them. Um, but what's cool about these clusters is we can then overlay them on our TSNE. So let me just, it might be taking a second to load everything here. Oh, so we'll also do UMAPs. Actually, it made a UMAP as well um, for its visuals. So it's just kind of being a little bit slow to load all this stuff. Um, there we go. Finally got there. And so this is the UMAP Strat returns with the clusters overlaid onto it. Um, you can see there's like some correlation between the UMAP and the Strat clustering. It has these two islands here of unique cells with a bunch of cells kind of mixed and muddled together here. If I was to start looking at this data, the place I'd start is these two islands because those look the most interesting. They're also cluster 13 and four, 
13 and 12 looks like. So they're maybe the two smallest clusters. Um, but I would just dive in with what's cluster 13. Um, Sprout also returns up and down regulated gene sets. So we can just go look at the upregulated gene set for cluster 13, sort by the full change, um, and see what genes are driving this cluster. Whoops, not sort by the full change. Um, it lets you go infinite with the Sprout plugin because it will divide by zero, which is kind of mm, annoying, I would say, but whatever. Um, SeekGeek won't let you go infinite because we'll add one to the top and bottom of the den denominator enumerator when we're doing the full change calculation. So that way, if something has zero expression or a really small amount of expression, it doesn't like inflate the uh, full change. Um, no, no genes that I see on the top of the list here, though, that are super obvious, you know, what this cell subset might be. But in general, you know, if we're trying to explore what the identity of these clusters are, we can use this up or down regulated gene list to see what genes are being expressed, like what genes are being upregulated. And that might indicate to us what this gene set, uh, what this population is. Um, let's go check out population 12 since it's up there as well. It's a much smaller list of genes, but I still don't really see anything I recognize. Okay. Um, okay, so we're kind of over time. I would encourage uh, anyone still in the call to leave questions in the Q&A or chat, and I can answer those questions. Um, while, though, I'm waiting for questions or just while we're hanging out, um, let's look at some more of the SROT results. Shot returns these heat maps. It has each of the clusters here, um, their parameters, and then the cells expression. So you can see the different cells expressions for the clusters. Um, you have this cool cascading heat map. Um, and so that's just another, the, the heat map maybe is the main neat result here. You can see what genes are driving each of the clusters. Um, and then another thing just to show, so, Going back to that original analysis that we were working with, I made a mitochondrial gene set. Um, I might just flip back to that since that's the one that we're familiar with. Um, so I have this mitochondrial gene set, and you might be wondering, what, what can we do with that? Um, and the answer is we can use it to try and identify maybe some dying cells. And the way we can do that is if we go to cell view, um, I would just set your y-axis to a histogram. And then for the x-axis, open up the x-axis wing here. I can click on that mitochondrial gene set. Uh, I can do this with any gene set, mind you, but I'm just choosing the mitochondrial gene set because then what I can do is I can take the sum of those mitochondrial genes and I hit apply operations. I make a new parameter called mitochondrial sum. And I'm gonna just switch this to log fold real fast. Um, I put it on a log scale and what we can see is there's some cells that have uh, there's a lot of the cells that have kind of this level of mitochondrial gene expression. Some cells that have slightly higher, some that have slightly lower. I might go ahead and you could always, you know, draw a threshold here and say, um, uh, you might call it like live cells or something and try to get rid of the cells, the higher mitochondrial expression, maybe even being a little bit. Um, and so you can try to remove some of those outliers that have a higher mitochondrial expression. Those may be your dead cells. Um, there's different ways you can set this threshold, but again, I'm just kind of taking the sum of all the mitochondrial gene expression and removing the cells that have a slightly higher um, than, than average mitochondrial gene expression. Um, and so there's all kinds of ways you can kind of use that to identify your dead cells. Um, and then you can do future analysis with this live cell gate. Um, another cool trick you can do in SeekGeek that I haven't really shown at all. If I go to my sample data, and it, um, if I go to this SeekGeek Extras folder that comes with the SeekGeek download, I can go to my gene sets. And in the gene sets here, I have a list of a couple of different types of gene sets. Um, I can grab my human gene set, drag and drop it into SeekGeek. And what this will load is a list of different types of human um, cell lineages. Um, and so what I can do with this though, so First of all, if I just double click on one of these, it has a list of genes that it's using to describe this human uh, cell, cell type. So like apopt apoptotic cells, it's saying include these genes. Um, 
if I scroll down the list, I have some other things like human pan T, human pan B, pan T, you know, we might recognize these are kind of like the hallmark T cell genes. So it's just trying to identify some of the populations based on those hallmark genes. Um, and so what I can do with that list though, is again, now I can go to my live cells. I actually just might want to move everything I've already done under this live cell population. I can drag and drop, uh, put it under the population. Oops. And then go ahead and delete them from here. Cool, now they're all under the population. Um, so again, if you're not familiar with Flojo, if a, if a population is indented underneath uh, another population, it means it's the child of that population. It means that all the cells, for instance, in my GZMA population are now also in my live and quality cell populations. Um, the populations that are next to each other, like OYZ and GZMA, those are sister populations. Um, they have really nothing to do with each other. They both have the same parent is the only thing they share. So they're both under live cell. Um, but okay, what, what I can do here though, is I can double click on my live cell population, open up my cell view plot again, go to my x-axis. And again, I can use those genes that sets at the top. Now I've added a bunch of gene sets. They all have HU in front of their names, luckily. So they're all kind of together. And if I want to maybe like, okay, let's try and find some classical monocytes. Uh, and maybe I have some NK cells in here or something interesting, not NKT. Um, yeah, or maybe, maybe I have some NKT cells. Um, I can go ahead and then try to, uh, again, I, I can choose individual genes, but I also maybe just want to hit apply operation to make the sum. I can look at the sum of the expression of these genes for these two populations. Uh, I might change my axis to log shift again. Um, and what we can see again is, okay, they don't really share expression of these. That kind of makes sense. Um, we wouldn't you know, expe expect monocytes and NK cells to share a lot of their common genes or a lot of their hallmark genes. Um, but what we are seeing here is, okay, maybe these on my x-axis are my NK cells. And um, maybe these are my monocytes. Um, I can maybe include some of these double positive cells. I don't really know what you know what these are, um, but just for the sake of exploring, we can always eliminate stuff later. We can do that, and then now I can do just to visualize it. I have these awesome T sneeze here. Uh, I'd be curious if it kind of lines up. So if I drag and drop my monocytes onto the T-SNE, the things I've identified as monocytes are now in blue and red is just all my cells. Um, let me just move this to the right. I'm going to drag and drop NK cells to add them to the mix. I'm colorblind, so I'm already struggling greatly here. I'm going to make this darker blue. I'm going to make this yellow, I'm going to make this gray, so that way I can kind of see the difference more sharply. And then the dots are too small for me. They're probably way too small for everyone on the screen share. Um, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit, but I'm also going to double click on this. And if you double click on the graph in the layout editor, you can change its properties. Again, the layout editor is kind of where we are like making the images, and we can change the properties of the graphs, kind of like you do in PowerPoint. Um, so the dot type, um, I'm going to keep it a dot plot. The resolution, I'm going to make the resolution higher. This will make the cells look quote unquote prettier. But I'm also going to use large dots and make the dot size bigger. So that way we can see it more easily. And the higher we set the resolution, the higher we'll have to set the dot size. So I might even go 32, but is that going to be too big? 32 is too big. Um, we can either increase the resolution, which will make the dots smaller, or we can decrease the dot size. You go like that, maybe. Okay, well, maybe like this would be good. So that maybe is an all right trade off of resolution and dot size um, that we can kind of see the dots. Um, and what I'm seeing is those things I've identified as NK cells are kind of really spelling into why I've identified as my monocytes. Maybe down at the very bottom, here's my NK cells. Those double positive cells probably aren't NK cells. Um, then we have our monocytes over here probably. Um, so if I go back and then uh, I can I can look at that gate, I can always adjust it. So here's some fun with live adjustment. So 
have these populations overlaid. I was really generous about my double positive. If I take out the double positives, I think we'll see, yeah, this area. Um, there will be less less cells in this area, but I do believe those look like they're primarily monocytes, and so I'm going to give it to the monocytes um, since they're all kind of grouped together here on the T SNE visually. Um, looks like maybe I'm cutting out a few of my NK cells here, but that's fine. So um, that's just some ways you can play with the data. There's there's a lot more. Um, yeah, so that's kind of everything in SeekGeek, or a lot of a lot of what's in SeekGeek. There's still definitely more. Um, if you have questions, again, feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, if, yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, feel free to send us an email. Um, again, our email is seekgeekatb.com. We'd always be happy to look at your individual data because I know you know a lot of data is different. Um, if you have any specific questions, you can always send them there as well. Um, I'll hang out for a few more minutes, but otherwise I might wrap this webinar up. Um, thanks everyone for attending today. Um,